and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is your Reverend, Faith and Current Affairs. Welcome to this very, very, very special episode of Irreverend with me, the Reverend Jamie Franklin. And I'm very pleased to be joined today by the Reverend Daniel French. Daniel, it's good to see you today. You're, you're in house arrest, uh, aren't you? You're, you're, um, you're, you're a, a political prisoner uh, because of your medical status. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, I got pinned this morning. Um, and that's the first time that's that's happened to me um right. and uh, yeah it's meant rearranging a lot of this uh coming 10 days so uh yeah i i had to fill out a form through the text which people may be familiar with this um at the end of it it asks you <laughs> um you know, would you like to give us any feedback as to how we could improve this service yes uh, jamie i'll just let you and readers' imaginations. Yeah. Put, uh, imagine what I put in that paragraph. Right. Discontinue the service, I imagine. You can you can improve it by self-destructing it. I imagine you said something like that. Mm, a little bit of political philosophy thrown in as well. Just. <laughs> very good. Very good. And um, I understand that you've been you haven't been taking any imaginary trips to KFC, or I mean, you wouldn't dream of it, would you? I mean, no, well, I mean, on, on the way back from, uh, we went to have a PCR test, and I was just thinking, gosh, you know, if I stopped off at that KFC and went through the drive through yeah. if I did that, would that yeah. would that actually be illegal? I, I'm just not sure, really. And, and if I was able to go back two years and tell to myself, you know, that I'd actually be thinking, you know, darling, we need to switch our phones off yes, uh, in case... You know, we are uh, put out as having um, partaken in the Colonel's cuisine. <laughs> not, not that we would do. You know, <laughs> the A thirty eight isn't that long, actually. You know, yeah, yeah. Got plenty of food in the in the larder here. Yeah. Well, um, I can tell you. I can't tell you. Sorry, whether it would have been illegal because generally I don't know, but I know it would have been delicious because. Mm. Um, but with Daniel, we don't want to go down because people start, oh, they'll be like, oh, don't talk about don't, don't, don't bring your innocuous banter into this very, very serious podcast. Well, we won't, because what we're going to say instead is that this is an incredibly special, this is a very special episode, not just because you're here and Tom's not, it's because we have an extra special guest. And today I gave people on Telegram a clue. I said, we've got a special guest. I can't say his name, but it rhymes with Bod Breyer. And uh, so a few people guessed, which I was surprised. Uh, no, of course, we do have we do have the the author and uh, cultural commentator Rod Dreyer joining oh. us in a little under 45 minutes. So um, I've got the books. You've got the books there. I've got Live Not By Lies here as well. Actually, with some notes I've been making. And I, I have got the I have got the Benedict option. It's just down there. I promise. I promise, Rod. I definitely bought the living it. You're living it, Jamie. I'm living it. And I also bought it as well. And I bought Live Not My Lies. And we, we are promoting, we are promoting these uh, books because they're really, really good. And it'd be fantastic uh, when Rod uh, joins us. Daniel, did you see, did you see, I don't want to call attention to this all the time because I'm not an egotist, but did you see the article Rod wrote? Uh, about me about what i'm calling the big baby tweet did you see this that's super cool wasn't it oh. yeah. yeah it was a cool photo of me oh yeah. I, it was actually yeah it was uh it made me look really, it made me look really sort of intense and almost yeah. like a kind of you know when you see like pictures of friedrich nietzsche not that i compare myself with him in any way but but a bit like that like you know really intense kind of you know deep but also kind of penetrating and um honestly i've got no idea where you piano are. reeves cassock yeah, I was wearing my cassock at the time. Yeah, I did an interview for someone and I, I, I wore my cassock. Um, I thought I thought that that would look cool. But I mean, to be honest, you know, I like to mix it up, which is why I often wear a, a sweatshirt, as the Americans call it, um, with my with my clericals when I'm doing the show, because I like to I like to relate on all those different levels. I would never wear a coloured clergy shirt. Right. No disrespect to anyone who would. But for me, black is the colour. Yeah, this is the right colour. And if you're not going to wear black, you shouldn't wear a clergy shirt, right? Just my opinion. Okay, I don't uh, want to offend. I don't uh, want to offend uh, anyone. Yeah, I agree. Sorry, Tom, and and everyone else who wears coloured clergy shirts. It's just not for me. 
It's a bit baby boomer, I find. Yeah, it's a bit. Trying to be user friendly. It's a bit trendy and naff, isn't it? Come on, do we really do it? Is that what really we're about? Like wearing check shirts with, with uh, dog collars? No, 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 no. No, it's all wrong. It's all wrong, Daniel. Um, right, I'm going to put um, call to action and some notices. Right, call to action. This is what I read about when I was reading about how to how to become a, an influencer. Yeah, because that's what we are, Daniel. We're influencers. Did you know that? I mean, in, on a very on a very small scale compared yeah. to like your Kim Kardashians and your, your Cristiano Ronaldo's. But nevertheless, we're on the same spectrum. Just well, that, That's very uplifting to know that now that I'm in, um, you know, bound to uh, this premises and in my own little cell, uh, you see, see, I've even got an exercise bike. You know, yeah, you're there, like just pedaling away, like getting really... So I can, you know, keep the old cardio going, yeah. during, walking, the, doing the prison <laughs> eight rounds, you know, and... Uh, yeah. You just said you were making some prison coffee to me before the, we came on. What does that mean? Just that you're well, in prison. I, I, I don't like coffee, so it's instant grand. You know, it's the grand. Oh, I see. I, oh, well, you're not going to like coffee if you to. make. You're not going to make like coffee if you make instant, are you? It's rank. No. It's rank. No, 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 I'm more of a tea person, but the. Um, uh, I just needed needed that extra oomph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm drinking tea. I'm drinking Earl Grey, um, which I've actually become quite uh, partial to in the afternoon. That's a very nice taste. Are you a Grey man? No. Too yeah. perfumey, I find. <laughs> I, have, I, I have milk with it. Okay. So so just get used to it, Earl, Earl Grey purists. I like yeah. the milk. Um, yeah. Listen, call to action, right? Thank you very much for listening to the podcast. Not you, Daniel. The people listening. Thank you very much for listening. Really, really appreciate it. And what I'd like you to do is if you like this episode, all the podcasts just in general, please, please go to wherever you get it and rate and review it and share it with all of your friends and family, everybody that you can. Please share the podcast and rate and review it because we'd like to reach more people. We, re we really would. Seriously, it's great to connect with people. That's what this is about. It's all about connection. So please rate, review the podcast and share it around. Please do. And uh, notices, if you'd like to support, if you feel some inclination to support the podcast, you can go to patreon.com forward slash irreverent. And you can support us. You can make a financial donation because this is £1.50 plus VAT, which is 20% if you're in the UK. I don't know what happens in other countries uh, per month. So you can do that if you'd like to, just if you'd like to, no pressure at all. Uh, you can email the show irreverentpod at gmail.com. And we read all the emails, try and reply to them as well but really appreciate you getting in touch. Join our Telegram group, which now has almost 900 people on it. Love Telegram, t.me forward slash irreverent pod. Some great discussions on there. And also we do sermons every week. Uh, irreverent sermon, sermon audio dot com. I say every week, sometimes we don't manage it. But most weeks, most weeks we put a sermon up there. So if you're in need of some kind of spiritual edification. If uh, you're of my generation, you have known the two Ronnies and uh, they say the beginning of the show is a packed program oh yes sunday night a packed program we have you know what um, yeah what, what uh, we, we are well we're a fresh expression of church i think we don't want to boast daniel but in terms of fresh expressions we've got to be up there in the top mm. five or six i would say i mean i'm not really aware of any others so i wouldn't want to i wouldn't want to sort of contrast us but i think we're pretty unique would you say that Mm. Yeah, and um, I, I think I, you know, in the last week or so, I've been really touched about how many e emails, letters, and things that I, I've just personally received with, you know, incredibly yeah, yeah. poignant stories. Yeah, and, yeah, and it's you know, it's on the edge stuff. You know, um, here, here I am, so jesting that I'm in 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 my own uh, prison for the next ten days. Uh, but when I did prison ministry, gosh, you know, 20 years ago, the great thing about prison ministry is you have none of the parochial bureaucracy or the um, faffing around with, you know, buildings and regulations. It was all eyeball to eyeball stuff with people yeah. in dire straits. Uh, and so you had these incredibly godly conversations and you yeah. felt like for, you know, that afternoon that you're in in there, um, that you were doing the Lord's own work uh, and it was intense and it was you know, existentially meaningful uh, as, and so on and so on. And uh, this feels a bit like that, really. You yeah. Know? yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, the, 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 I think as the battle intensifies between good and evil, it just it just makes everything more real, doesn't it? it makes everything more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so things. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I, I hope I'm able to reply to as many as I can, and you know, help them signpost people to um, to to further help if we're not able to do that ourselves. But yeah. you know, that, that these are profound. That there are profound conversations going underground. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I get lots of great emails as well from people, uh, lots of people in very difficult situations. I think particularly as the mandates are coming out. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, serious, serious difficulties for people. Um, and it is a privilege to receive to receive these emails. Um, if and... I were to say as a typical pattern, I mean, I mentioned this in a Mallard article that I did about three, four weeks ago. Yeah. That typically, you know, what we're receiving is is folks who are saying that they're finding their uh, faith either reignited or it's a, a first time discovery uh, and um, they want to be able, they want someone to interpret that for them yeah and to advise and to push them forward sadly some are going to um uh, they go to church outlets mm. uh, and finding a negative response yep yeah yeah absolutely it's a bizarre situation isn't it it really is a bizarre situation uh, but lots of lots of people are in it. Um, yeah. Well, to that end, should we do our? Um, we're starting now with. Uh, we're going to start with a little prayer these days, Daniel. I don't know whether you saw. Did you see the show last week? Yep. Yeah. So we started with the Lord's Prayer, and I think we'll do that again uh, this week. So um, and then we'll have a little reading, and we're going to we're going to go through the Book of Revelation. I was joking. It's probably going to take about seven or eight years uh, to go through the whole thing. Uh, so um, let's begin uh, by saying the Lord's Prayer together. You, if you want to say it out loud, Daniel, you might want to put yourself on mute because there'll be a there'll be a gap. Um, so uh, if you'd like to, if listener and viewer, you'd like to join in with the prayer, please do. Uh, shut your eyes and um, and uh, engage with the prayer. If not, then uh, just take a few seconds. So let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, thanks, everyone. Uh, Daniel, I have to say, uh, because I use the Book of Common Prayer most of the time, I always... I always trip up over the different words in the Lord's Prayer. So I use the traditional one in public, but I would never say the BCP, you know, they did like in earth in public, but I would using the BCP in my own time. Are you still on mute, by the way? No, no. You're I, there. Uh, you're there. You were just doing a lot of like facial expressions. And I was thinking, oh, yeah, uh, maybe you're on mute and you're just being really sort of dramatic, like, you know, one of those silent movie actors, like you know, really exaggerated uh, facial movements. OK, let's have a reading. So last week, we just began the book of um, Revelation, the apocalypse, the revelation to John. So we'll just read a few verses uh, from chapter one, beginning in verse four. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, every, everyone who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother, who share with you in Jesus the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So a lovely, um, lovely passage there with, with, with so much imagery and there's sort of far too much really to, to pick out. I guess to help people as a kind of guide for where this is going, um, the Apostle John is about to relate seven letters that he received from christ to seven different churches now this these letters they probably were sent to actual churches but these letters have overwhelmingly been taken to um be 
corresponding to the church throughout the ages. So, so they're meant to speak to the church in the present day as much as to the churches of the time. So that's what it's talking about when he says to the seven churches. And it's talking about who these letters come from, which is essentially Jesus Christ. And um, here we have what is technically called a high, a high Christology. I think, I think it's very, I think it's very uh, clear to say, uh, meaning that um, we have a picture of Jesus Christ which is, which is very, very exalted. We're seeing something here of the, the deity, the God-likeness of Jesus Christ. So the things that are said about Jesus Christ is that he is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So the firstborn from the dead there is speaking about his resurrection. And it's implying that those who are in Jesus will share in his resurrection. He's the firstborn from the dead and we will come after him by participating in his resurrection. Um, it speaks about the way he loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood. So it's speaking about the cross, the remission of sins that Christ has brought about through the cross. And then it mentions, of course, his second coming. He is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, everyone who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. It reminds me of the, um, the, the um, Charles Wesley. Um, Lo, he comes with clouds, descending um what's that what's the verse which is um every eye will now behold him i can't remember exactly how it goes but it's basically a um it's a um paraphrase of this isn't it yes um, it's, uh, yeah it's I'm wonderful sure. yeah low, low he comes with clouds descending which is which is a, an advent hymn isn't it so uh, it's a wonderful hymn and appropriate for the advent season that's coming up and then here there's a very high there's a very high um a Christologically high verse here. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. So it's speaking about Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega. St. Augustine says the Alpha refers to Christ as the creator and the Omega refers to him as the redeemer. But it means the first and the last, the, the totality, the sum totality of all things. And he even refers to him, it's even referred to Jesus as who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So this is a pretty unambiguous statement of the deity of jesus christ here in uh, revelation uh, chapter 1 verse 8 and then finally we have john who is one of jesus apostles tradition has it um it says we share with he shares with you in jesus the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance uh, which is a wonderful sort of um summary i think of of the Christ, the normal christian life uh, we, we share in tribulation together. We share in the kingdom in the sense we share a foretaste of the kingdom. And we also share in the patient endurance together. So there's a sort of sense in which, you know, we have a foretaste of the kingdom, but we also on this earth, we have tribulation and we have to have patience as we endure the struggle, uh, struggles that we face in following Jesus Christ. And indeed, John is on an island called Patmos, which I understand is just some kind of horrible sort of lung, lump of rock. And he'd been exiled there uh, on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So for his faithful witness. And um, I mean, when you read through the book of Revelation, I mean, I'm sure you've had this experience, Daniel. I mean, it's all about that theme, isn't it? It's all about um, it's all about being a martyr, not necessarily in the sense of being killed or shedding your blood for your faith. And although that is there, but in the sense of being a witness, which is where the word martyr uh, the etymology of the word martyr it just means um to witness in in greek so i think the, uh, the, the in in church speak we talk of martyrdom in different colors don't we there's yeah. the red martyrdom which is some people who've given their lives but there's also other martyrdoms white martyrdom i think there's a green martyrdom um in terms yeah. of pe people whose lives um that's that's lives... not, that's not uh, greta thunberg no no i don't think so no, no. Sorry, I interrupted. Well, before her time. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so th th there is this, there's the martyrdom of daily living. Yes. Christian life, faith, yeah. uh, in recognition of the kickback and the struggle that that has. You know, you know, I think a really good example of that is um, is being a mother. You know, and that might sound that might sound sort of, um, I don't know, it might sound slightly left field, but you know, it strikes me that um, being a mother to children is uh is is a wonderful act of self-giving generous love and it's often and i think increasingly so in our society um something which is just 
despised really not only not only not celebrated but but looked down upon as something inferior and yet um you know i see my wife with our three children and see how comprehensively um uh tiring and and um challenging but also life bringing being a being a mother is you know not just raising children but also actually actually forming them in your own body and giving birth to them um and 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 coupled with that the kind of the way that motherhood is held in derision in our society it's i think it's a really good example of 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 uh green martyrdom as you say like everyday ordinary giving of yourself yeah i think uh, jordan peterson's spoken about this isn't he about how we um and I, it, of course it applies particularly and acutely to motherhood yeah but fatherhood as well in that um, yeah. we could easily in our lives come to a point having retired from you know great careers or not so great careers not yet yeah. missed yeah. maybe not maybe not so great careers <laughs> for us <Yeah. laughs> Carry on. Uh, a series of sidesteps to the grave yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> a series of lateral movements yes, and, and found found that the the one vocation that we were given of you know, of being a mum or a dad was the one that we so under under invested yes and that was the vocation was the most important task that was given to us that was standing right in front of us but the, yeah. the glamour of the world in a sense took us elsewhere yeah. it, it also reminds me of there's an eastern orthodox saying that you start on sunday morning we start worship when we leave the house as a family right and that i, I mean i've i'm sure you, i bet you've seen this in in parish context jamie i know i i've seen this that you know you get a a, a young family come to church maybe let's say a single mum with a few kids they're toddlers, they're young. She comes into church, she's pushing the buggy, she's got them all ready. You know, she's probably have to maybe breastfeed one or um, keep an eye on another one. Uh, and um, uh, she's got her hands full. She doesn't really hear the sermon. Yeah. She can't really sing the hymns. She can barely say the prayers because her, her, her mind is elsewhere throughout yeah. the whole thing. You know, yeah. and what will she receive from some people, you know, um it, it'll be i don't know why you bothered coming yeah or why did you come with those noisy children or yeah. brats you know because yeah. we children are one of those categories isn't it where it's so easy to slip off the tongue i hate children yeah um and if you don't say it you know, let alone to 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 communicate that in all sorts of other ways uh and yet you know if you took that um little bit of orthodox wisdom what it is saying is that that person has worshipped in that congregation more than anybody else not necessarily mentally but by the t by the fact that she has sacrificed her ability to get anything mm. out of worship apart mm. from the sacraments yeah um in that task you know yeah, uh, yeah. and yet it's so easy you know to get for, for that person to be on the receiving end of the tut tuts yeah yeah um, uh, and i suppose what i want to say is please keep coming yeah absolutely um, and forget about all of that the fact that you have got through the porch is the biggest act of worship you're, yeah. you're worshiping far more than, than people who've just come with none of those bounds and constraints yeah you and climbed a mountain who are tut tut tutting because uh because they don't want the kids there yeah i mean that's a lovely that's a lovely thought daniel it's, it's actually very moving and I, i'm sure that i'm sure that mums listening to this will, will really appreciate you saying that um so i think one of the things that's interesting isn't it about the book of revelation is that we can relate to the concept of green martyrdom <laughs> i would just think of like the you know the eco stuff i can't help it when i say that word but but you know that kind of ordinary everyday martyrdom that is well, that is how we've had to interpret these texts hasn't it but increasingly it does seem like there is a time coming when perhaps our witness may have to be more costly and of course that's what we're going to be talking about with uh with oh. Rodrea oh. later what sort of things have been happening current affairs wise church and well I'm, I'm glad you asked I'm glad you asked that Daniel and it's, it's not at all a contrived question of course um but we have of 
we have the uh, the news that's coming. We've got um, Archbishop Cramer has done a good article on this that uh, Durham Cathedral is now well. It's saying it's going to demand uh, COVID passports for uh, Christmas worship. Uh, D- Durham Cathedral is dividing its flock into sheep and goats for Christmas. The dean is setting the COVID vaccinated sheep on his right hand, but the goats who lack an NHS COVID passport shall go on his left. Then shall he say unto them on his right hand, come ye blessed of my father and attend our service of lessons and carols for Advent as we prepare to celebrate the birth of Jesus. For ye were unclean, but now ye carry an NHS COVID pass as proof of vaccination. Or ye suspected ye were unclean, yet can now prove that ye are not with a negative PCR or lateral flow test taken up to 48 hours before the event. There's endless, there's, there's endless fun with this kind of thing, isn't there? Yeah, I think um, I need to do one of their uh, <laughs> alternative Rocky Horror Show uh, service, yeah. services on this, the admission of a parishioner to church yeah. on their health status. Yeah, uh, so, so it's traditional language or contemporary, depending. Yeah, exactly, yeah. you definitely got to have the option to make it inclusive. Yeah. Um, so... Um, they, so one of the points that the uh, Archbishop Cramer makes is that um, by introducing this requirement, the Dean is ignoring the Church of England's official guidance. Now, I don't know whether this is the Church of England's actual official guidance, because this was actually issued in response to the passport, the uh, vaccine passport letter that we put together, yes. and which, which uh, we got thousands of uh, church ministers to sign. Um, I'm not entirely sure whether the church was uh, even happy about giving such a, a statement, uh, but it, 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 um, it appeared in the Telegraph. The church's position, the statement says, from an anonymous spokesperson. So who was it? We don't know. A church's position has been a clear policy of encouraging people to be vaccinated, but other than in very exceptional circumstances, what those circumstances are, we can't possibly know because it's not said. But other than very, is, is a lesson of is a, is nine lessons and carols a very exceptional circumstance? We don't know. Could be. Could be. Um, maybe it was 18 lessons and carols. Maybe it was 170. So you'd be absolutely certain of um, of infection. Uh, Opposition to limiting access to church services or organisations on the basis of vaccine certification. Uh, Oh, sorry, that's just the end of the sentence. I read that wrong. Uh, Such an approach would run contrary to the principle of the church being home and a refuge for all. Similarly, only in exceptional circumstances is the church likely to utilise vaccine certification in order to facilitate additional services to its members or to the wider community etc etc um so the the point of this article is that um the dean is going beyond what the church of england have uh, officially said i guess i guess um uh cathedrals are they're fairly they're kind of legally um like a parish church i suppose allowed to do what they like as far as this kind of stuff is concerned so really it's not i mean this obviously reflects badly on the church of england and it particularly if it sets a precedent but really this is a as as far as i can tell this is probably a a decision of the dean and chapter of durham cathedral i would have thought what do you think daniel yes i I think it might it it must be um who knows very difficult to discern what the mind of such uh eminent ecclesiastics would be but here, here we have it 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 did get traction on the wonderful uh neil oliver oh yeah monologue on GB News, which I think he puts out Saturdays, doesn't yeah. he? Um, the one, his, the one, what was his refrain in it? It was the, about... The thought for the day, really, that the, the thought for the week that he does. And uh, he was asked... The one where he was saying, history doesn't repeat, it rhymes over and over again. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Four yeah. minutes, 59 seconds in, uh, he puts up this very um, piece by Cramner and says, you know, where ye therefore are the church leaders in all of this. Yeah. 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 You know, and um uh and, and, and of course he's also mentioning uh in uh, in a big way Australia and Austria and what have you and, and why haven't our political class and the mainstream media commented on this? Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, um, it's 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 kind of hard to say, really, isn't it? I mean, um, I think the reason the mainstream church hasn't uh, commented on it is because they the way that they deal with controversial issues is by just not saying anything about them. Um, and this is a kind of this is the sort of modus operandi of the Church of England in general, isn't it? So um, 
it's it's very it's very easy to comment on things, for example, like climate change or Brexit. Uh, but if it's something like this or something like the issue of abortion, for example, the church simply says nothing, even if it, even if it does have um, an official position or a kind of quasi official position. Everything's always a little bit ambiguous in the Church of England, isn't it? But that is the way that church deals with it. Um, and um, I think we're pretty clear, aren't we, Daniel, that we don't really think that this is a this is a good thing. If something is um, if something is a, a, an issue, particularly an issue that's affecting directly the church uh, or the people in the church, the church should say something about it. Um, and in this case, um, you know, I think Archbishop Cramer, Cramer is exactly right. The church is meant to be a welcoming and hospitable place. Uh, it's got a wonderful opportunity at Christmas to reach out to people and to introduce this uh restriction to essentially ban people from coming into a church based on their medical status is uh, profoundly antithetical to the spirit the faith i think also he makes a he makes a good uh, point here when he says to compound people's loneliness and isolation at christmas with further rejection is unconscionable i think it's a good point because and it's a serious point as well because uh, christmas is a time when people who are struggling for whatever reason can become very depressed um, and uh, have really difficult time. Uh, suicide um, rates spike at Christmas. Uh, people can get very, very depressed. And for the church to be sending out the, the, the message that if you don't have certain medical treatments, um, then you're not welcome. It's, it's not a good message. And then, of course, there's also the, the um, precedent, isn't there? So is this, is this just the beginning? So, is this, so unless you're on this vaccine track now, so you have your vaccines, you have your boosters every six months. Unless you do that, what you're not going to be able to come to church, you know. What, no, you, I, I, mean, sure I, I, have, I, I did find the dean's email in Crockford's clerical directory and right. email, but I haven't had a reply yet. Asking is what was his justifications for this? Right. And also, I, I look with interest to see if he thinks that this is a testing ground. Yeah. Does he envisage all cathedrals, all parishes doing this at some point? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, or is Durham just an exception for whatever reason? You know? It's hard to understand why it would be an exception. I mean, it's an enormous cathedral, as big as any in the in the in England. And um, it's it sort of seems like a cathedral, even on a you know, on a straightforward kind of logical basis would be the last place you'd need to introduce something like this because they're so absolutely enormous. But yeah, um, we've been doing social distancing for about a thousand years in, the <laughs> in, yeah. cold, in cold, icy cold, sterilised buildings. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, in all seriousness, though, like, um, you know, there is no historical precedent for something like this. This is totally novel, isn't it? I mean, there, there have been times when churches have been shut down because of political issues within the church, um, you know, not for you know, 800 years, but nevertheless, it has happened. But the notion that you will be screened in some way to work out whether or not you're infectious. And if you're, if you're deemed to be infectious, you're excluded from the church. I mean, you've got to, you've got to, your mind goes back to the gospels, doesn't it? To, to the lepers, to Jesus, to Jesus touching the lepers and, and healing people who are unclean and, and being welcoming of, of social outcasts. I mean, it really is, I've, I find it strange that people don't see this. And, and, and in a building that communicates a, a supernatural reality. Yeah. I know, you know, everybody can play this in their own way as to how much of a, a, a supernatural place this is. Or is it just a functional building? But, you know, I, I can imagine the atheists turning around in years to come and saying, well, what was so special about your buildings if you just had to imply, import the exactly same regulations? You know, yeah. Yeah. How can you say these spaces are sacred, they are near to Jesus, um, and yet put all this, and yet put all this on? The only discriminatory thing I can find in the prayer book for coming into worship is um, the, the, the prayer book's invitation, which I've never seen actually played out, uh, that those who wish to receive Holy Communion uh, are to make themselves available to the cure, to the curate, to the rector, mm. uh, and um, he is to judge whether they are worthy or not. Right. Do you remember that particular yeah. admonition, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, I, I've never seen it played out. And sometimes I've teased, you know, sort of those who want prayer book eight o'clock on Sunday uh, at all costs, that maybe on Saturday night, we could have this re reading out. It, if you wish to receive Holy Communion, I yeah. could read Cramner's text out and then essentially you could make your confession mm. uh, or otherwise. I was I was sort of thought you know this picture of them sort of coming around your house the the night before and sort of yeah just having a I don't know a cup of tea or something and you sort of cross examining them it's 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 uh, yeah it'd be quite interesting to try it out see what happens yeah it's it's, it's interesting that we we don't spiritually discriminate yeah um, yeah we're quite happy to do COVID dis, you know healthcare discrimination yeah I mean it's yeah on on I mean I know we're sort of joking about it and everything but it is really quite shocking when when you when you think about it and it's uh it re it reveals something about the spiritual state of the church yeah, very um, topsy-turvy isn't it yeah, when they're trying to when they uh, I, I think Rod Dreher you ought to, you, you ought to ask him actually yeah. he, has a, he has one of his stories he's on his first week in Bulgaria <laughs> going to a, going to a, um, a Bulgarian Orthodox Church and turning up for Holy Communion and of course you in that denomination, you can't just turn up to mm -hmm. Holy Communion. You have to have given your intent, you know, and he's yeah. basically asked, well, who the heck are you? Yeah. Who, who are you to come and receive Holy Communion? You're, you know, Rod who? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he, he has to sort of, he says, you know, he has to, he had, there's a bit humble moment where you have to say, well, yeah, I am, you know, a practicing Christian and I know the creed and I, you know, I, yeah. And this, I think I'm in a state of grace. I've fasted and you know, blah, blah, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, Daniel, what do you so we've we've also got this this news about the uh so the in Austria they were having a lockdown for the unvaccinated, which they decided wasn't working. So they just went for a full lockdown, and now they're talking about having a vaccine mandate. So they're going to make it mandatory to be vaccinated in Austria. They've also been, what's that, sorry? First of February. Yeah, first of February. Um, we're talking about in Australia, people being, I think I saw, I'm not sure where in Australia, but people being rounded up by the army and uh, placed in in um, quarantine camps. I mean, uh, it's kind of disturbing, isn't it? Yeah, the, the Queensland story, I wasn't so sure. I did a bit of digging on yesterday. Um, I'm still not totally sure what is being talked about. Um, and initially it was dismissed as, oh, it's just quarantine centres for those coming into the country um, and you know, glorified hotels that you might have had at, at, at Gatwick and Heathrow being emulated there. But I, I noticed a few... Um, a few journalists were retweeting this yesterday with some seriousness and saying, no, it seems to be more than that. I think Julia Hartley Brewer has right. done a piece on it um, for talk radio. Um, so it does seem to be more than just that, more than just quarantining visitors coming in. Um, it's, it's very chilling, isn't it? How we've normalised all of this. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the Austria thing is extraordinary. I mean, if the current figures are right, 40% of the population are, are unjabbed. So, you know, do, yeah. if everyone step, took one step back and said no, um, and we're not gonna pay the fines, yeah. what are they gonna do? They're gonna imprison? 40% of the population. 40% of the population, yeah. You know? uh, I, I know there was talk also in Australia about the, about seizing assets and things as well. I mean, this, this again made me think about this afternoon with that, you know, the temptation that I had to go to KFC uh, as, uh, yeah. as I passed uh, on the dual carriageway and thought, well, I suppose if the British government had uh, its own crypto digital currency, of course it could completely block yeah. My journey is, you know, to, uh, all I might be able to do is purchase enough fuel to get home that the algorithm would calculate. I wouldn't have even been able to buy a chocolate bar in the kiosk. Yeah. Um, but I certainly wouldn't be able to do any shopping. Mm. The yeah. currency would have switched out that option. Yeah. Not only would you not get served at KFC, but you'd probably get arrested as well because it would send a signal to the... Uh... 
local COVID patrol and they'd come over and, and um, arrest you and take you to a quarantine camp. Yeah, the colonel's colonels. <laughs> yeah, very good. <laughs> I mean, it is, it is scary, isn't it? Uh, you know, uh, we sort of, we, we joke about it, but it is, I mean, I, I, I do think, so in my, the conversation I had with Joe Boo, he, who's in Canada, he said he does think that the unwritten constitution of the United Kingdom is actually helpful here and does provide, um, I think your Labrador's just come in, and does provide some, um, some safeguards. Um, but even so, to see this happening in westernized, I mean, you know, it's, I suppose in some ways, you know, in Austria, I mean, does it make it worse, the Second World War? Does that make it worse that it's happening there again, or is it more understandable? I mean, I it's... Know, that, what, isn't it what they say, the op the spin doctors say the optics look terrible. Right, yeah. Yeah, well, they certainly do. I mean, in um, in uh, thingy, Freddie Sayers' piece and Unheard, um, when he's interviewing these people and the, the sort of cold um, and... Um, the cold way that they're talking about people who haven't been vaccinated um, is, is well, it's sort of literally chilling, really. Um, so, yeah. yeah, so, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't really know what, what there is left to say about this apart from it's just, you know, it's just crazy, isn't it? And, and uh, I wonder, I do wonder what's going on the churches in, in these nations. I assume they, they must have some kind of emerging underground church network now, um because obviously the church have rolled over yeah yeah the churches will be totally ham hamstrung by this i mean this is an assault on the church as much as anything else no, so no, it's no. crazy um daniel can i read out i i think if rod is on time he'll be with us in about five minutes so let's uh read out the email of the week shall we um dear reverends thank you so much for your wonderful work it lifts me spiritually every time i listen and gives me so much hope for the future Feel like you're part of the, a movement that are building an arc that will get us through the hard times that are coming. So keep speaking the truth and giving glory to God. I'm a midwife of 18 years experience and I'm facing the prospect of losing my vocation if I don't capitulate to the vaccine tyranny. I'm currently breastfeeding, so no way would I consider even consider putting it into my child's body without long-term safety data. I'm also a traditional Catholic and would, given the choice, not take a treatment that is associated with abortion. Your podcast on the vaccine with the pro-life minister was invaluable to my discernment on this. There is also a young nurse at my church who is a single mum and massively relies on her job for income, who is also steadfast in her refusal to give in to this evil. We both feel that we couldn't bring ourselves to go through with it, and the integrity of our souls is more important than a job we love. So please pray for us as we are praying for you. Thank you for your bravery. We need more men like you in the world now more than ever. God bless you and your families. Well, I mean, I think we can say pretty categorically can't we Daniel that these people are, are showing far more bravery in their situations than we are through making a podcast I mean it's um I mean I just can't even get my head around coming you know being at that stage that's I mean it's, it's extraordinary um we've gone from clapping to sacking mm. yeah yeah which um, yeah, you know, it's an interesting point going back to Revelation. So we had we had we got Rod in a minute or so. Yeah. So okay. what, what struck me, I, I preached on this on Sunday on the Feast of Christ the King, that um, if we look at Revelation as a whole, what it begins with are these seven letters to the churches, which will presumably here in the next few weeks yeah. we'll get into those. That um, the seven churches don't seem to have enormous pressure being put on them. Uh, it, it, it's they're, they're somewhat in the suburbs of empire and yet six out of seven in a sense are falling apart yeah uh, and there's there's a lesson in that in terms of the churches to me what the let what the letters to the churches is saying that the churches need to get their act together yeah uh and we need to internally be in, in a good and right place within ourselves um because when things ratchet up to the next level, and we see that as we read further on in Revelation, mm. uh, then um, what use are six lukewarm churches? Yeah. yeah what, what is six lukewarm churches in Austria? Yeah. Pointless. Yeah. Might as well sell the buildings and make them into flats. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yet these, this midwife and this nurse, that's what our churches need to look like. Yeah, well, it's 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 um, it's a refining 
fire of of um, martyrdom, isn't it? Which which will prove our faith. Um, you know, and, and I think it's it's easy to talk. It's easy to talk big, but it's actually a question of um, whether we're able to walk the walk as well. But you know what, Daniel, uh, I've just seen that um, Rodrea has entered the waiting room. So this is very, very exciting. So let's should we admit Rod? Yes, let's do it. Here we go. He should be coming in right now. Here we have. He's connecting to the audio. This is very exciting, Dan. Of course, you and Rod are old friends, aren't you? So, um, so there's a there's a familiarity there. Drum roll. Drum roll. It's. I think it's. Um, they're six hours behind, so I think it's about ten o'clock in the morning, mm. where Rod is. Um, I don't actually know which state. Somewhere Central Time. Do you know where he is? I've got a feeling it's Louisiana. But Louisiana. Oh, how cool! How cool! Um, still no noise or picture from Rodre, but we can see his name. So we know we know he's coming in, don't we? Ah, there he is. I, I was waiting on you. <laughs> we were just doing the drum roll. No, I saw, hey, I gotta show you guys something. My, uh, my mother just moved out of her house and she dumped a bunch of things that she doesn't want, including this giant picture of self. Wow. <laughs> wow, you're a handsome child. Uh, well, no, it's uh, it's it was doctored clearly. I had a very big head. You know, when I was born, you could hear my mother scream clear to the next county. But yeah. uh, so, so Rod, where's where's that going? Is that a going above the marital bed or? <laughs> it's going into the closet. <laughs> and, uh, no, it's um, but it's so funny because I to, to see this thing actually in my own house is strange because. For decades, I've seen it hanging on the wall at my mom and dad's house, and yeah. now it's not there anymore. And it's, I, I hadn't, I, I knew that this was inevitable that my mother was going to have to leave her house one day. She's elderly, she's a widow, and she fell and broke her hip, blah, blah, blah. But to actually go through it, though, and to realize that uh, one will never again go see one's childhood home, I mean, it's, it's jarring. Yeah. Yeah, 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 and those and those and those objects—they they carry something of your your life, don't they? They do. Have you ever seen this French film about ten years old called uh, "The Summer Hours"? No. Uh, it's well worth seeing. It's um, it's a film about a family uh, in, in France, and they've grown up for generations going to this same country house somewhere in the countryside near Paris. And when the matriarch dies, the th her three adult children have to decide what to do with the house and all of its belongings. Mm. Well, it turns out that one of them, the older brother, is a lawyer in Paris. He wants to keep the house. But the daughter is an artist in New York, and the younger son is a businessman based in Shanghai. And so the house just, it's impossible to keep, and they end up having to sell the house. But mm -hmm. it is such a melancholy reflection on how, um, on, on the feelings that we have from place and from objects. And in mm -hmm. the final scene, I'm not really spoiling anything, the, the, the older brother and his wife are in the Louvre, and they're in one part where some of the antiques that have been in the house that they donated to the, to the Louvre are displayed as, as museum objects. And get this bizarre feeling when the husband and the and his wife are looking at these desks and things that had been such a part of the family life decontextualized and put into a museum and uh, I remember watching it thinking this is what it's going to be like for me and for mm -hmm. all of us one day even though nothing in my mother's house would go to a museum but you know one of these days we're going to are going to decontextualize it when all of these things that have always ever been since childhood in my house are no longer there. Well, that day has arrived and it's it's a strange feeling. Mm, yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine this this lady called, have you heard of this lady called Marie Kondo who teaches people how to get rid of their stuff? And I think mm. it's, it's, it's deeply psychological because because we have this we have this relationship this kind of inchoate relationship with our stuff and this is why people become hoarders because it's actually easier just to put stuff in a pile somewhere than to think you know what is this thing to me you know do I actually need this can I get rid of it and getting rid of stuff yeah. you know is 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 difficult um it, it is yeah no I was going to say Rod um just I mean this is a <laughs> it's great that we're having this such a deep conversation right off the bat and I expected nothing less but uh, we should probably introduce you formally. So Rod Dreher, you're, a, you're an author, a cultural commentator. Um, Rod, I'm sure 
I'm sure loads and loads of our listeners will know exactly who you are, read your books and been very inspired by them. In fact, Rod, not, um, you know, I'm not buttering you up, but I was having a conversation with a, a senior priest earlier on today, someone in the Church of England, which it might be encouraging to know, um, about, about particularly about you coming on. And uh, he, said, he said about Live Not By Lies, that for him, it articulated some kind of inchoate thoughts and feelings that he'd been having for a long time. And there was something about it which kind of crystallized, you know, your words crystallized and articulated something he'd been feeling and thinking. And I think that's true for lots of people. I think particularly um, your books, The Benedict Option and Live Not By Lies have, have really helped people to articulate those kind of, uh, you know, those sort of inchoate thoughts and, and feelings. Um, but do you want to just sort of uh, introduce yourself a bit and sort of say, you know, who you are and what you're about um, to begin yeah. with? Yeah, well, um, I'm a uh gosh, I'm 54 years old. I've been a professional journalist for over 30 years. But uh, in the last uh, 10 to 15 years, I've focused primarily on uh, culture as opposed to uh, politics, which is in which has been this thing that I'd previously focused on, because I think that all our political problems are ultimately cultural problems. And Primarily, the thing that concerns me is the survival of the church in this post-Christian and increasingly anti-Christian era. Uh, I'm an Eastern Orthodox Christian. I, uh, I came to Christ as an adult through the Roman Catholic Church and was a very faithful Catholic for, gosh, 13 years. But my, uh, my Catholicism began to fall apart when I started writing about the abuse scandal back in the early 2000s. Uh, I had always been the sort of Catholic who thought that whatever challenges the world throws at me, as long as I have the syllogisms correct in my mind, the defense, the apologetic defense of the Catholic faith, my faith would be fine. Well, it turned out not to be true. And I, I learned a very difficult, painful lesson about the, the primary importance of the conversion of the heart mm. and uh, that your conversion is all is only it's always precarious uh, unless your heart is converted. If it's only cerebral, it's not as strong as you think it is. Anyway, God was merciful to me. And I, uh, when I bombed out of the Catholic Church, I started attending an Orthodox Church, not with no intention of becoming Orthodox, but just because I wanted to go pray in a place that was uh, where Christ was truly present in the Eucharist. And from a Catholic point of view, that means the Orthodox Church. Mm. And when I went into the Orthodox Church, I was living in Dallas at the time with my family. I was just stunned by the beauty and the depth and, and the sense of community there. And so I did convert, but um, I, I, try, I have tried since then. This was 2006. I've tried since then to be um, more modest about my, my claims for church because I had been quite a, a triumphalist as a Catholic. This wasn't something the Catholic Church put on me. This was me. Mm. And uh, so I've tried to avoid getting involved in Orthodox Church politics. And uh, I, I've seen my, my, uh, my vocation as a writer to serve the entire church, what I call the small O Orthodox Church, which is to say Christians in every particular confession or denomination who uh, believe uh, in, uh, in tradition, broad, broadly conceived. I think the, uh, the uh, Anglican um, the theologian Hans Borsma mm. has a great book called Heavenly Participation oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, about the about sacramentalism in Christianity. And he calls the pre, um, pre-modern church the big G, big T, great tradition. Mm. And he says that we all, all of us Christians today, have to find some way to return to the great tradition if we're going to survive as a communion. Uh, I, I generally agree with that. And that my, my two most recent books, The Benedict Option, 2017, and Live Not By Lies, are written from that perspective. Benedict Option is about what, how can we Christians, what ways of life do we need to adopt so that we can be resilient and faithful in, uh, in modernity, and Live Not By Lies, the more recent one, is, a, is more focused on responding to persecution, mm -hmm. uh, which the people I, I talk to, the ones who initially tip me off to what's happening were people in America and even in Britain uh, who had escaped to the West to get away from communism, who are now saying that the things they ran away from are now manifesting here in a different way. And people in the West simply don't see it. Mm -hmm. So I, I get, try to give the platform their, their voice, their critique, and, uh, and I got advice from them about how Christians today in the West 
how we should be living in order to resist this and to uh, maintain fidelity. Mm. So that's basically my story. And I, I, I write um, on uh, my blog at theamericanconservative.com. I have a sub stack and uh, I'm on Twitter and all the usual. Yeah, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. And uh, I have to say as well, Rod, thank you for writing a, a post about, about my recent controversy. I really appreciated that. Well, you know, I have to say that this is the sort of thing that just lights me up what they did to you that, you know, saying a simple Christian common sense sentiment, like babies are good, families yeah. are good, that that gets you dogpiled. I mean, that that is, a, a, yours was a, a perfect example of how we in the church or our, our co-religionists are destroying the faith. Yeah. I mean, there's just, a, 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 and it just, it baffles me. And, and there's so many people within the churches who see what's happening, but won't raise their voice, won't defend those who have been set up, mm -hmm. uh, who, who have been set up on. And I, I think one thing, uh, Jamie, that that drives me here is when I was first starting to write about the abuse scandal in the Catholic Church, this was uh, summer of 2001. And throughout 2002, things broke big out of Boston in 2002. I had so many people writing to me, priests and lay Catholics, saying, oh, keep going, keep writing, everything you say is true, um, here's what I'm seeing, and I would say, oh, that needs to be made public, would you, would you please uh, give me a statement or give me some documents? Oh, no, 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 I couldn't possibly do that, I could lose my job, I could lose my position. I saw this kind of cowardice happen over and over and over, and those who would take a public stand would be eviscerated by uh, by you know those in power, and uh, all these quiet Christians keeping their heads down wouldn't say a word. So I, I vowed never to be the sort of Christian who doesn't say a word when someone is being unfairly attacked. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, and uh, I don't think we on this podcast could be accused of being Christians who don't say a word about things, whether the words are valuable or not. I suppose is a, is a is a different issue, but I mean. Um, so this is just let's can I just bring a, um, just delve into this issue here about this uh, this small o orthodoxy thing because I think on our I think on our podcast we've we've generally kind of um, had a perhaps a similar approach as well I I, I tend to think of you know C S Lewis's concept of mere Christianity I find this I find this quite helpful um, you know that there's a kind of a broad base of orthodoxy that that connects uh oh. Sorry about that. Somebody just tried to phone me, and my uh, my Mac um, my Mac picked it up. You still you're still all there, aren't you? I'm still here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is the first time this has ever happened on the podcast, which says something about my <laughs> level of my level of popularity. So uh, hopefully that won't happen again. Um, it's so, your yes. bishop calling. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, um, I run and hide in a, a closet. Um, no, no, it's it, it wasn't. It wasn't. Um, so uh, what was I saying? Yes. So um, yeah. So we're talking about orthodoxy, and I think one of the things that perhaps is quite shocking. I mean, it's shocking to us inside the church, but I think also people looking looking out in is that actually the church persecutes itself, right? And this mm -hmm. is this is just this is just common. Um, so so I think you know for me that this is the reason that that. Um, well, this is the home of orthodoxy is in tradition, isn't it? You, you know, in, in, in the Anglican Church, I think of what's called the uh, Vicentian Canon, you know, what all people have believed at all times in all places, uh, broadly, broadly speaking, you know, tracing, tracing these things back to Christ and the apostles. But I think, I think the problem is, is that um, the, the, you know, I can't really say it any other way. It's like the liberal wing of the church is, you know, to me, it's got a completely different religious epistemology, right? It's, it, it, it believes that in this sort of, as far as I, I can tell, and I really have had a lot of experience of liberal Christianity, but it's this kind of, this very sort of vaguely defined sense of, well, you know, experience and um, reason can also lead us to the truth. And therefore we can sort of throw away concepts which the church has believed for 2000 years. Um, and that's something I feel, and which, and which in many cases are just obviously scriptural. And that's something I'm I'm really uncomfortable with personally. Yeah, uh, you know I, I've thought over the years oh, what how would one how would you define small o orthodox Christianity? I mean, in the, the, or mere Christianity, uh, because it's a sort of thing that um, that you, you know it when you see it, but it's it can be difficult to to define it in words. Uh, this is something that I've seen my entire life as a Christian here in this country. How 
you have people as uh, theologically different as, say, a conservative small town Southern Baptist and a Latin mass going Roman Catholic in New York, yet they have more in common than, uh, say, the Latin mass Catholic would have with a liberal Catholic. Well, why is that? And I, I think that it has to do with our relationship to sacred order and the nature of truth, mm -hmm. that whatever our, our differences, and they are significant uh, within the smaller orthodox camp, all of us believe that sacred order exists independent of ourselves and that it can be known through scripture and, and through other means, depending on our confession, and that, we, that the, the point of the church and the point of human life, the life of Christians, is to conform ourselves to that sacred order as best we can. Modernists, though, whatever their confession, believe that um, there is no such thing as sacred order, or if there is, it's malleable, and we can reinterpret uh, the scripture and, and traditional teachings of the church to suit our felt needs in the moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can find these people in, in orthodoxy, you can find them in Protestantism and Catholicism, of course, but I think there's a huge, huge divide there. And it's, um, it, it is a jarring thing. It was to me as a new Catholic, a Catholic, adult Catholic convert to realize, uh, get inside the church and realize that uh, our that basically they've reproduced the conditions of Protestantism within Catholicism, that the unity and doctrine and unity around the Pope is a very superficial unity, that you have people who follow two different religions, even within the Catholic Church. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think it's true to say, Rob, that, um, and you, you've written a bit about left brain, right brain thinking, and that, uh, you know, where, where, where two are biased towards the rational, and that the modernist is the sort of person I, mean, I see this a lot in the churches. Um, they're very good at climbing the career structures uh -huh. because, for what, well, for one reason or another, may, maybe it's because you know, th those of us who are not that way inclined uh, are, are more uh, attracted to the mystical and to the sacred, and our heads are mm -hmm. our heads are kind of elsewhere, really. And so yeah. it's easier, to, in a sense, to see a power grab happening because uh -huh. people who are very uh, you know, acutely good at um, reading the optics, uh, uh, knowing the levers to push, mm -hmm. end up controlling the, the, the whole ship. And, and what we have, you know, in the Church of England, I'd say that there is uh, a, a modernist minority who essentially run the show. They're, they're good at getting elected to things or, you know, mm -hmm. they have the right kind of CVs. They get, uh, they have an interest in those things in, in, in the way that, you know, Many ordinary Anglican, uh, even broad churched uh, vicars are really just not fired up by that type of right. thing. They right. want to get on with the bread and butter of work and the, 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 uh, the beauty of the, and the sacredness of their context. And yet all the time there is this sort of long march of, uh, of figures who are steering the ship in a completely different way. And, and the, I think Douglas Murray said this, that, you know, uh, a lot of us in the in the conservative culture are just pretty rubbish at protesting, and we're pretty mm -hmm. rubbish. At, we're pretty rubbish at all that kind of political stuff. Right. And I think so. We find ourselves, you know, yeah. at this stage now, just like uh, totally frustrated. You know, I, I see right. the tweets that Jamie got, all those attacks, and think, how did those people get there? Yeah. Yeah, well, as you say, they're very good at negotiating the, the bureaucracy. I, there was a famous quote by this radical feminist Catholic theologian, Rosemary Radford Reuther, who said in the 70s, somebody asked her, well, why, why are you still in the Catholic Church? You hate everything it stands for. And she said, because that's where the photocopiers are. And what she meant by that was the, the, the Catholic institution, you're laughing, but it's true. The Catholic institution has all these resources through which they, the radicals can spread their ideology. And if they left the Catholic Church in protest, they wouldn't get any lift off. But if they stay within and infiltrate within and march through the institution, they can gain real control. And that's what's happened. I think for me, though, what was one of the most um, fascinating and disturbing things to see covering the Catholic abuse scandal was how the line between good and evil, between corruption and righteousness in the Catholic Church did not pass between the conservative bishops and the liberal bishops. Uh, it passed down, to use a Solzhenitsyn phrase, it passed down through the middle of every bishop's heart because you saw conservatives like Bernard Law of Boston, most famous, 
you saw that when it came down to it, he was rotten to the core, that he, above any religious principle or moral principle, he placed the, the bureaucratic principle of protect the institution. And you saw this happen all across the church, whether you were left wing, right wing in your theology, it didn't matter. You know, the bishops primarily were all about defending the institution. I think they, they had made an idol of the institution. And uh, that, that was really something, right? Because I, and I, I've talked, talking over the years to parish priests, they would say, yeah, this is what happens. You know, you, you, if you come into ministry aspiring to do good and to rise in the hierarchy so you can you know, gain more power to do more good, inevitably there are small compromises that you make. And, and you tell yourself, well, when I get into power, I'm not going to be that guy. And by the time you rise up, you have been thoroughly tamed mm. by by the institution. So I think that might be part of it. But, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, what's so weird too about it is these people who run our churches, uh, or, or run the Church of England, the Catholic Church, I don't think this is really the case in orthodoxy, at least not yet, and please God never. But uh, they, they're very touchy feely, and they're not, uh, they're not left brained at all. But they operate according to the, uh, the structure of the world that the left brain has has uh, has created the framing of the world. In other words, where there is no meaning in anything, everything is the material world is just stuff that we can rearrange like we want to. But they bring in the intuitive, uh, touchy feely side uh, and, and graft it onto a, a left brain approach to the material world. Do you see that? Do you think I'm onto something? Yeah, de de definitely. I mean, I think we see that. Uh, for, for instance, in the way that um, in, in the last few weeks, the Church of England has grabbed onto the, the climate change agenda uh, and made it uh, and made it almost, to use a technical word, soteriological. You know, we're, yeah. mm -hmm. we're participating in saving the planet. Well, you know, uh, there, there's rights and wrongs to that. I don't necessarily want to get into that, but uh, it, it struck me that. Um, there's never the same energy for saving souls. Yeah. Yeah. And that language about the necessity to get your own stuff right with God it is completely kind of poo pooed. Um, yet, uh, they're very quick to talk about, say, you know, Brexit, climate change, what, whatever, you know, the, these, the, these uh, grand social justice issues. Um, but the spiritual, the spiritual contexts are almost ignored. Yeah, and so I just watched yesterday this uh, two-hour lecture by Jonathan Pajot. Uh, you probably, some of your listeners no doubt know him. He's an yeah, sure. Eastern Orthodox icon carver and uh, an intellectual in Canada. And he was talking about the me uh, purpose embedded in reality. And he said that uh, he was talking about inclusivity, quote unquote, inclusivity, and he said that the concept of inclusivity will destroy any institution that takes it up and, and opposes it to quality. And this is not from a moral point of view or a political point of view. He's talking about simple purpose, that uh, if an institution discriminates in its personnel in favor of anything other than what it was constituted to do, then it inevitably will fail. I think you see this in the Church of England and many churches, when the salvation of souls ceases to become the, the, the primary directive, the prime directive, and you cease to se select ministers for on the basis of their ability and zeal for conversion of souls, then inevitably you'll break down. I think this is the story of many, many churches in our era. I think Bishop Barron picked up on this. I, I saw the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse um, YouTube piece uh, a few days ago with Bishop Barron, Jonathan Pajot, um, Jordan Peterson, and um, I've forgotten the four. Verveka. I saw... Verveka, yeah, I've yeah, struggled to pronounce his name. Yeah. yeah, I guess I haven't seen it yet, but I saw it advertised. And so now I'll go back and take a look at it. I, I, I think, you know, particularly Bishop Barron picks up on this, doesn't he? That... Um, this the sense that we've we, we've lost our ability within the church as a whole you know the, the cv corporately to speak to the nation about people's inner lives we're great at talking about all these grand um uh, these grand social or ecological problems 
but we've lost that we've lost that ability to speak as the church fathers did you know as augustine did uh, and the, and so someone like jordan peterson is sort of reaching out to people because as bishop baron said you know without knowing it you stumbled i got you stumbled against you stumbled into the way that the early church fathers uh, opened up the scriptures pastorally and spiritually to to people and that's what the churches aren't doing and what strikes me as particularly ironical particularly you know, in the last 18 months got all these people suffering from mental health problems mm. um and, and internal you know, crises about the meaning of life and uh, death is suddenly before them in, in a way that it hasn't been before and the church has nothing really to say to them, or at least that section of the yeah. church. And you think, gosh, there's such an enormous market. Yeah, yeah. People, people yeah. wouldn't be listening to us. People would not be listening to this podcast as much if the church was doing its job. You know, I mean, we 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 started this podcast, you know, just over a year ago, and we don't, you know, I sort of feel like we're not doing very much as revolutionary. We're just talking about <laughs> the culture and trying to apply the scriptures to to our lives and to the culture and to people's lives. And we get, Daniel and I was just talking before you came on, Rod, we get emails all the time from people saying, you know, they're coming to faith through the podcast or that the podcast is providing them this, this spiritual solace and help. And in a way, that's great because, you know, we're really happy to be helping people. But in another way, it's absolutely heartbreaking because this is just what the local parish church should be doing. Yeah, and and yeah. I often say, I went to the local vicar and, you know, and said, you know, I read this, <laughs> I read this really interesting book. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, you know, they get chased out of town. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, look, when I went to Italy in 2018 on for the Benedict Option book tour there, when the book was translated into Italian, uh, I was told at the very end by my publishers, they said, look, we didn't want to tell you this before you came because we didn't want to intimidate you. But there, there was somebody in the Vatican, they didn't name who, someone in Pope Francis's circle who called around different dioceses in Italy saying, don't welcome Rodrier into your diocese to talk about this. Well, um, Car the Cardinal of Genoa uh, rebuffed that person and bought a copy for each one of his priests in his diocese and invited me there. And even the very liberal now Cardinal Archbishop of Bologna, Zuppi, he welcomed me too, even though he's a leftist. So I was grateful for that. But it just goes to show you how small-minded a lot of these people are like if you don't agree with my book that's fine let's debate it at least let's yeah. uh, show me why i'm wrong but yeah. for them it's mostly about control and is a particular it, is, it, is, it, is it because the sorry to interrupt you but is it because it's a progressive ideology which hitches its wagon to the culture right and so what you're saying in the benedict option if i read you rightly is that the culture's the culture's moving the opposite direction. I mean, you do say as much in, in Live Not By Lies as well. The culture war is lost. But for the progressive, you know, both inside and outside of the church, that's antithetical to the yeah. message that they're trying to get across, right? So I can well imagine why. Yeah, exactly. And especially on LGBT issues. That's yeah. that's the big one for them. They think that the, the thing that I see as... Um, as decline, they see as uh, as the opposite, that it's a great thing happening. And the, the main thing that I, as I recall, that the partisans of Pope Francis hated about ben, uh, Benedict Option was that um, I called on Christians, including Catholics, to withdraw strategically, not completely, not head for the hills, but withdraw strategically so we could build up our own, uh, you know, thicken our communities, uh, build up our own spiritual disciplines and so forth, so that when we went out into the world, we could be, we could more faithfully represent Jesus Christ and a, a deeply Christian way of seeing things. Well, they took that as uh, Roger is telling people uh, to violate what Pope Francis says, and Pope Francis wants us to go to the peripheries and blah, blah, blah. And I say, look, we should go to the peripheries. We have to evangelize. That's We don't have a choice there, but you can't give people what you do not have. And to look at the, uh, at the statistics uh, of, at least in America, of how little American Catholics and American Christians in general know about their own faith. Mm. You know, it's very, very weak. Mm. And uh, and you can't, again, you can't go to people and, and evangelize them for something you don't even understand and you don't actually practice. Yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, this is good because it's getting into, it's getting into the meat here. And in, in a way, I might be asking you to, to sort of repeat stuff that you've already written about. But, but when you're talking about a strategic withdrawal, what are the main, I mean, I've got my own ideas about this, um, and Daniel will tell you I've got my own ideas about lots of things, but um, what, what, what for you are the sort of the main 
sort of things where you look at Christians and you think, you know, you're going to have to change that because you're not going to survive, you know, if you carry on like this? Well, I, I think uh, probably the, the, the biggest thing you have to figure out, you have to come, you have to reconcile yourself to as a Christian is the fact that if you are going to be faithful to Christ in this post-Christian era, then you're going to have to give up the idea that you can be a fully paid up member of middle class, professional, successful society, because that's just not going to work. Uh, I, I think that so much of American Christianity is the middle class at prayer. And we do not like the idea that we have to suffer or give up anything. We want to be fully assimilated into American life. And look, I, and I don't want to be a hypocrite here. I'm, I'm, I've done very well in my, with my career, and we're, we're pretty middle class ourselves. Nevertheless, uh, it is a radical thing to most American Christians to tell them that, you know what, you may not be able to be a doctor or a lawyer, your children may not be able to go to Harvard, and so on and so forth, out of fidelity to Christ. So that's the main thing, to realize that we are exiles in this world today. But uh, and there are practical things too, like uh, having to establish a um, an adversarial relationship with uh, social media and with with electronic media with one's children and so on and so forth, and having to in in live not by lies. I talk about the Benda family of Prague, who are the only they're the only Christians in Václav uh, Havel's inner circle there, and during communism, the the anti totalitarian circles. And uh, Camilla and Václav Benda raised their children uh, to, from the get-go to be uh, countercultural. For example, these kids would have to go to communist schools. It was, it was compulsory. But when they came home, their parents would talk to them about, what did you learn at school today? You know, here are the lies, here's what's true. And uh, they raised them to understand that they were exiles. Mm -hmm. you know? and, and I compare, when I talk about the Benedict Option, try to explain it to people. I say, look, I believe that we Christians are called to live between Jeremiah 29 and the early chapters of the book of Daniel. Meaning, Jeremiah 29, God spoke to the Hebrews in the Babylonian exile through the prophet and told them to settle. I brought you here for a purpose, settle in the city, pray for the peace of the city, take wives, etc. But in the book of Daniel, we see what that looked like for three Hebrew men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know, they were so uh, assimilated and embedded in Babylonian society that they served the king. Mm. But when the king told them to bow down before the false idol, they chose the prospect of death in the fiery furnace to uh, apostasy. They preferred to die rather than betray God. So uh, we have to ask ourselves today, we Christians today, how can we live, even though we are embedded in Babylon, how can we live so that Babylon is not embedded in us? And that when we are put to the test, we will do as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, as opposed to following the herd to conform. Yeah. So, so with, sorry, you go, Daniel. Uh, you, uh, you, you said that uh, Christians will probably have to con consider a simpler life you know not not having all the sort of benefits of middle class life not but i but i wonder also if they're going if smaller orthodox christians are going to have to also look hard for theological teaching and that the yeah. universities yeah. the seminaries the, the the schools are not going to necessarily be providing this um, and that's yeah. another thing that we have to we have to bring theology uh to the people yeah. in a much more acute way than has been done in the past like like the underground churches did in Czechoslovakia that there are all these schools of theology that exist mm -hmm. um, yeah. rather um, Kolosovic, Kolosovic wasn't it uh, um, I, I just wondered if you might want to say something about that because uh, I know you mentioned that in Live Not By Lies yeah well, you, you know, I, I, I tell the story a lot because it's so it's so on point. Back in around the year 2000, when I was still a Catholic, my uh, we were living in New York and uh, 
my my wife and our, our friends, our Catholic friends would gather for dinner. We would inevitably, the men always would start complaining about what the bishops of the church weren't doing and what the institutional church was failing to do in terms of catechesis and so forth. And uh, one night we had a, a Catholic priest friend who joined us and he was of our generation then, he was in his forties. And he said, listen, everything you say about the failures of the church are true. You know, it's horrible. He said, but it was horrible in the 1970s when I was a child and my parents realized that they could not depend on the institution to form my sister and me as faithful Catholics. So they took it on themselves. He said, fast forward to today, uh, when any one of you in this room can go into amazon.com and have sent to your front door within a week to 10 days, uh, a library, a theological library that Aquinas couldn't have dreamed of. You can do this yourself and you, you can network with each other online. You can come together with other parents because we were all parents who feel this way, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you just have to have the initiative. Mm. I remember we all looked at each other and thought, yep, yep, Father Wilson is right. And then we went right back to complaining about the bishops. Mm. So um, the and because it's it's hard to do this. We want to be able to rely on institutions. We ought to be able to rely on our institutions but we just can't. Uh, that's why homeschooling has really taken off in classical Christian schools, such as the one my, my children attend and where my wife teaches, because um, we have at least the liberty, at least in this country, to take these things onto ourselves. The problem though, and this is something that I, I forget his name, Alistair, uh, he's, he's in C of E, uh, young man, theologian, gosh, I forget his name. It, it's he, not Andrew Davidson, is it? No, no, no. Um, Anyway, he, he published a, a really long and important essay five or six years ago talking about authority today and how, how it is in our culture. You have so many uh, Bible teachers uh, coming up who are becoming very popular and authoritative in people's lives. He was talking mostly about evangelicalism, uh, yet they don't have any theological training. He was talking about people like Rachel Held Evans, the late Rachel Held Evans and Jen Hatmaker, some of these that have become really popular among progressive evangelicals in America. But you have the same sort of people in conservative evangelicalism where the people themselves, the masses are going towards teaching that sounds good to them, but may not in fact be orthodox or solid at all. So the problem is not just in the institution with the teachers. The problem is then is with the masses, the students who may not even recognize any authority other than themselves. I mean, yeah. is this something you see, you guys see in your work? Yeah, I think so. I think I think that I think that's very I think that's very um, insightful. And it almost makes me think that, you know, as as a priest now with, you know, you've got social media, the Internet. So people have, as you say, a completely different situation to, you know, 500 years ago. So so what do you do as a priest? It's almost like people have an abundance of food and you have to tell them what to eat, you know, and how to eat uh -huh. it rather than actually feed, you know, cooking the food yourself. If that makes sense. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's 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 really quite a provocative thing, actually, um, to, to think about that, because at the end of the day, people can just go and get whatever they want. Right. right. You know, they right. can just not listen to you. They can sit there for, for 20 minutes a week, not listening to you and then spend hours like listening to podcasts and stuff like that. That's right. And and look, this is a problem we can see clearly on the theological left, but it's also on the theological right, yeah. especially in a country that is as um, populist uh, in these in, in the sense as the United States is. Mm. You know, I, I'm lately hearing from some of my Protestant friends that they're within their circles, people are talking about starting home churches yeah. because they don't trust because of COVID or whatever, they don't trust the institutional church. So they're just going to do it at home. Yeah. Well, and, and they don't see a problem with this because they've been acculturated in a, in a culture that values the individual conscience so much that nobody can tell me what to do. And uh, this is yeah. a problem on the right as well. Yeah, yeah. Can I just um, run something by you? Because it's been something I've been thinking about for a while and I'd be interested to get your take on it. When you're talking about, you know, when you're talking about um, being strangers and exiles in this world, and also the thing you said as well about the, the, the dividing line not being between necessarily liberal and conservative bishops. Um, it seems to me that, um, it seems to me that there's this kind of insidi insidious, um, this insidious heresy, which which I which I see over and over again, which is like this idea that our role 
as Christians, and this I have to be sort of careful because it's it's so insidious, it's actually hard to articulate, but our role as Christians is kind of to, to bring God's kingdom here on earth, full stop. Mm-hmm right full stop now that's the full stop is the problem right because yeah 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 of course of course there's of course there's truth in that i mean it's part of the lord's prayer right but but if you cut off all the supernatural elements from it the the eschatology and i mean well particularly the eschatology i suppose um then then you're just left with an entirely immanentized religion right and this is why you get the archbishop of canterbury at COP26 saying, this is literally the most important thing that's ever happened. Because if you if you don't care about, or if you don't, if you're not, if you're not sort of cognizant of the fact that the kingdom is, is a is a future state rather than a present one, and it can only it only it can only come in the present in a kind of um, you know, in an inchoate and, and totally un, unfulfilled form, mm-hmm. then, then you will start, you will start hitching your wagon to progressive ideologies which are ultimately going to be utopian right and it's a serious mm. problem it's a serious problem because then you're then you're in the soviet union and you're saying oh yeah great you know let's let's continue with this utopian project and you know we can crack a few crack a few eggs in order to make this omelet do, do, right, I mean, right, do, right. do you think i'm on something there oh of course you are of course you are and i the thing that frightens me uh, frightens is probably too strong word but concerns me is seeing this same impulse now arise among certain Catholics of the right. I'm talking about the integralist. You know, I, I call what they're calling for, um, they're, they're, they're right in their critique of, of the degradation and the decline of liberal society, but they want to replace it with some sort of fusion of church and state and, you know, where the, the state proclaims the moral law and they think that this is going to get everyone sorted. And uh, while I, I may be more personally comfortable living under some kind of integralist state than under what we have now, at the same time, I, what I call what they're doing is the Grand Inquisitor option. Hmm. You know, the uh, Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor, who created a system so perfect that people didn't have to be good. Hmm. You know, to, to steal the line from T. S. Eliot, um, the Grand Inquisitor in Dostoevsky's parable, when, when Christ comes to the the city. Uh, the Grand Inquisitor knows exactly who he is, and he tells him to get out because they he, they have created a system so great that all of people's concerns and worries and and uh, their uh, spiritual anxieties are taken care of by the system. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that there is within all of us, uh, whether we're on the left or the right, although this this utopianism tends to express itself more fully and more emphatically on the left, there's always this idea of the perfect society. Now, I, I think, as you say, Jamie, it, it's certainly true that, that we're, we are allowed to, we need to participate in the kingdom of God and try to bring that into this world. But the full stop, as you say, it's precisely the problem. We have to know that it is impossible to do mm-hmm. this side of heaven. And uh, as Vogelin said, don't eminatize the eschaton, which is, <laughs> I think, a great phrase. Yeah. But, um, uh, but, but yeah, but when you, when you, object to that sort of thing. Now we're getting a lot of pushback. And I've seen this just in the last month or so on the right and the Christian right here in America. They accuse you of being squishy and cucked is the, the phrase they use. And <laughs> just like, I, I, I don't think right wing totalitarianism is, is much better than left wing. Yeah, exactly. Is, uh, is the kind of remedy to that? Because it's a very nuanced thought, isn't it? What, what you've just said. And um, uh, it's a fine line to to get that right, but it strikes me that could the the nuanced antidote to that it is really going back to that sort of Jonathan Pajot's much of his YouTube's it is our embracing a the transcendent and our embracing of the transcendent is by a, a sort of a reenchantment, you know that mm-hmm. uh, the, as Christians I think the deeper our participation in the liturgy. Uh, the more that we embrace the mystical in in its proper healthy sense Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, the the more that we get the balance right and that we're not we don't fall into that we don't fall into that utopian precipice right daniel sorry to rod to to cut across you but i i think i think there's an issue i think it to, to be honest it's 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 the sin issue right it's like we don't want to we don't want to talk about we don't want to talk about sin so, so we ignore it and we pretend it doesn't exist. But the, you know, the, the Christ, Christ's um, victory, you know, on the cross and in the resurrection is over the twin powers of sin and death. And this is why we can never have a utopia. 
right? But these are the things, particularly sin, at least in the Church of England, we don't want to talk about. So yeah, sorry, Rod, I didn't mean to cut it. No, 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 no. It's, that, that's it. And sin and, and the, the necessity for humility. One of the great gifts of the uh, Orthodox Christianity to me has been its very strong focus on personal humility and personal conversion. Um, and uh, it, it seemed the Orthodox Church has many problems, not so many in America because we're a weak church. And in Russia, though, it's the power church and they, they, they're struggling with issues of corruption and power there. But um, if you're doing orthodoxy right, you're constantly confronted with, uh, with your own humility, with your own imperfection. And if you take it seriously, this has to inform the way you see all institutions uh, and, and, and all the, the limits of everything human, because in original sin will uh, infect everything. And uh, I, I think that, you know, you're bringing up, Daniel, the, the whole idea of re-enchantment. This is going to be my next book, I'm, because uh, I think this is the culmination of this project I, I've started uh, with the Benedict Option, is uh, I, I think deep down the re-enchantment of the world, and by re-enchantment, I don't mean like, you know, the sprinkle fairy dust on something and suddenly it presto change, oh, it's magic. I mean, coming to return to what uh, Hans Borsma calls the, the metaphysics of the first millennium of Christianity, the idea that God is everywhere present and fills all things. But what we have done in modernity is we have blinded ourselves to the reality of God's presence. Well, I'm interested to know how can we reverse that? How can we allow the Holy Spirit to heal our eyes, our spiritual eyes, and, and open our ears to the voice of the Lord? Uh, so much in modernity I've learned from my studies has, and this is, goes back to the Ian McGilchrist thing you were brought up earlier, Daniel, about um, the master and his emissary, left brain, right brain. We have selected in Western civilization to, uh, for the left brain, to, we, we've sought to uh, suppress intuition and uh, the ways of knowing, intuitive ways of knowing that come to us through art, through literature, through poetry, uh, through uh, re religious practice and sages and so on, in favor of the concrete, the um, the data driven, the strictly materialistic, etc. Dr. Ian McGilchrist, who wrote this great book uh, about eleven years ago called *The Master and His Emissary*, he's not a Christian, but he says that we have gotten seriously out of whack by valuing the left brain over the right brain as a way of knowing. He said it accounts for our our great uh, success technologically in terms of science and economics in the West, but what have we lost? Well, I would say we've lost God. And if we lose God, we're going to lose everything ultimately because God is this is the basis of all reality. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. It's very interesting, uh, you mentioned the word sage, which made me sort of smile because it, I don't know if you're aware that in the UK, the government's uh, scientific, the equivalent of, of Fauci is called sage. Actually. Ah. <laughs> uh, and um, one of the things that was mentioned earlier on is sage is populated. I don't know how many there are on this committee, say there are 30 or so. Um, they, they are all... You know, clinical scientists, um, epi I can't say the word now, um, virologists, um, and behavioral psychologists, behavioral scientists. Yeah. And someone said early on, where are the artists, the musicians, and the theologians? Are they not part of our salvation story through mm. this pandemic? Mm. Yeah. And so, what we saw in a sense was this, this uber um, left brain solution. Mm -hmm. Maybe sometimes we need that, but you know there were no caveats, there, right. there were no fuzzy bits to the edges of of this solution at all. This, this was a totally uh, scientist scientist driven solution to uh, getting us out of this. And and yeah, and you can feel that. You know, where, yeah. where, where was the poetry uh, in any of what happened? Um, and so, is, is it no wonder then that you know one in four teenagers end up with some, you know quite severe mental health issues by the end of the first lockdown because they have lost at that connection to uh the, the divine in this or, or if they are you know they go to the churches and most of the churches are basically cutting and pasting what sage are telling them oh, well you know you don't need to worry about god now what you need to do is wash your hands yeah. 
task and do social yeah. distancing. Right. right. And I, I, one of the things that's driven my interest in this is reflecting on my own conversion, my own coming to Christ as a young adult which began in the cathedral at Chartres in France. Mm. Um, I had, by the age of 17 in the 1980s, decided that religion was bunk. It was just, it was either crackpot uh, TV evangelist or it was bourgeois conformity. Um, but in any case, it, it had nothing to say to me. And then I, I walked into the cathedral at Chartres on a trip that my mother had won in a church raffle. And I, it blew me away. I Nothing had prepared me in my life growing up in small town America, late 20th century, had prepared me for the glory of God made manifest in this cathedral. Now, this I don't think this experience would be as possible for uh, an English person because you do grow up with beautiful medieval cathedrals around you all the time. But for me as an American, I was overwhelmed by the sense of awe. And that sense of wonder, that radical encounter with wonder that overwhelmed all of my intellectual defenses against, uh, against God, uh, I, I couldn't unsee what I had seen. And I walked out of that church, not as a new Christian, but as someone who was on a search. And it culminated six or seven years later with me finally deciding that I had to have Christ, that Christ was real. He was the most real thing in the world. After I did an interview as a young journalist with an elderly Catholic Monsignor who had been an atheist uh, early in the 20th century and who had had two remarkable, miraculous encounters with Jesus in the Eucharist that caused him to abandon atheism and not only to abandon atheism, but to give his life to Christ as a priest in the Roman Catholic Church. And I, sitting there with this old man in his retirement home and as he wept talking about the um, the events that had happened 50, 60 years earlier that had radically changed his life, I knew that this man had seen something, had seen something real, and that I could no longer hide behind my own fears. I had to embrace Christ. Mm -hmm. So um, I want to try in this book that I'm about to start working on, I want to try to convey to the readers that these things happen. They happen to people all the time. People are afraid often to talk about them. They don't want to be thought crazy, but th these hierophanies, these uh, manifestations of the holy, they, they do break into our daily lives and they're signs to us that there is a higher reality and that we're called to live within it. Mm. Yeah. Rod, I don't want to um, be self-promoting, but um, I've just had my uh, my book published, which is called Charles Taylor and Anglican oh. Theology, Aesthetic Ecclesiology, which is a conversion of my PhD. And uh, I wouldn't be normally this self-promoting, but what you've said is just so absolutely germane to my central argument. It's something which I've I've believed strongly for, for a number of years that the church you know, the, the, the church is apologetic in this day and age has to be aesthetic, right? It can't, it can't, it can't keep on appealing on the rational level because oh. this is not something which works with people. I think particularly young people today, it's got to be something which captures their spirit in an aesthetic sense. And this is one of the reasons I think traditional Christianity is making a comeback, at least in yeah. some form is because people want the ritual. They want the tradition. They want the sacraments. They don't want, you know, like, you know, I'm sorry, but they don't want like guitars and drum kits and 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 whitewash walls. I mean, Tom, oh. my other co-host, would kill me for saying this because he's a he's a low church Protestant. But like, I really believe this. Yeah, yeah, I, I think you're right. You know, I, one of the things I talk about all the time is one of the most uh, insightful things I ever heard was something that Cardinal Ratzinger, the future Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, said. He said the best uh, arguments the church has for itself are not the propositional arguments. They're the art the church produces and the saints it produces. Yeah. Yeah. And what he meant, I believe, is that you one encounters wonder when you're confronted with something extraordinarily beautiful that incarnates the truth of Christ or, or uh, with, a, with a holy person whose life incarnates the truth of Christ. These things open the door of the mind to propositional truths, mm. but uh, the the contemporary mind is, for whatever set of reasons, is just not open to rationality in the way that it was in the past. And I, I think when you show people something real in, in an aesthetic way or in the in the way of a, the life of a saint, that draws them. We've seen this in our little Eastern Orthodox parish here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana over the COVID thing, um, we're seeing more and more young people coming, especially mm -hmm. young men. And you ask them, we're happy to see you, but what drew you here? And they keep coming up with some version of orthodoxy is real. Mm 
Mm. And I think they're making, without realizing it, they're making a metaphysical statement, a statement about the aesthetics of the liturgy that draws them into a, a sense of a stronger sense of metaphysical reality. But they're also talking about uh, that orthodoxy demands something of you. You're not simply passive sitting there, listen to someone lecture. You know, you were called out of yourself. That really appeals to young men, the fasting, the prostrations, all of these things. Mm, mm, yeah. Um, Rod, um, when I um, when I announced on my Telegram group that you were coming on, there were lots of, when I say, sorry, I shouldn't say my, I should say our podcast Telegram group that you're coming on. Um, there are lots and lots of people who are interested in your view on, on COVID. So do you, mind, do you mind if I ask you about this? Um, so it, it seems to me that when you were writing Live Not By Lies, it's, I guess it was all just sort of kicking off. So it must have been strange for you to be writing this book in this kind of, you know, this 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 situation where everything was very unclear, you know, as to what was going on and so on. I mean, I, I just I guess I'm interested to ask you, I mean, what was your sort of initial reaction to the, the COVID situation? And and. It, I heard you actually talking on Daniel's with Daniel on your your podcast about this recently. It seems that your your sort of um, concerns over it might have um, developed somewhat um, yeah, in, in yeah. recent times. I mean, could you? Could, I'm sure people would be fascinated to hear about this. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I locked the manuscript of "Live Not by Lies," meaning I couldn't change it anymore. The editor, the editing was finished in mid March of 2020, which was just when the COVID lockdowns were beginning. Uh, the book didn't come out until September 29th, so we had lived through the advance of the COVID experience and the George Floyd riots and things like that. And I think these things help drive sales of the book. But um, I, the way I felt about COVID when it first came out was, you know, look, we're hit with this new disease. We had no experience with this. I didn't mind at all the the lockdowns, the things that our bishops in the Orthodox Church were telling us about no liturgy until we figure out what's going on. And they opened up again as soon as they could, but we had to wear masks and things like that. There were some people in our congregation, usually young men who wanted to fight all of this. But uh, one principle I applied was something I learned in doing the Live Not By Lies research from Dr. Sylvester Kirchmeri. He was, uh, he died in 2012, but he was a young leader of the underground church who spent 10 years in prison in the 1950s for defying the communist government. And Dr. Kirchmeri, in the memoir he wrote late in his life, he said that uh, he, he, he realized he had no control over what was happening to him, but he decided to see it. Uh, he decided not to pity himself because he said, if I pitied myself, I would collapse. But he saw it as something God was bringing him to, to learn more about, uh, to deepen his own repentance, but also to serve others and learn more about what it meant to live. And this is what got him through it. And I thought, that's what we can do here. Again, this is early COVID in um, like 2020. We can do that in our parish. We can we can make this sacrifice uh, and see what, you know, we, let's not rebel against it. Well, as time goes on, we, we went back to church eventually and, uh, and everything worked out. I have seen though uh, that it's really troubling me a great deal the way the the COVID regime has has progressed and and you know gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Where now we as, you, as we're talking here, just last week uh, the Austrian government announced mandatory vaccinations. The German government has said this is coming here too. Uh, my friends in Europe say this is all coming, and I I think this is tyrannical. I really do. I'm vaccinated myself. I just got my booster last week, but to compel people to take into their bodies this thing that they do not want uh, when it is not necessary. This is not like the bubonic plague. It, it troubles me greatly. And I believe that the, the whole COVID regime, so to speak, is, is becoming a, 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 a presentiment of, of totalitarianism, mm. you know, because what they've shown they can do and they will do uh, for, to compel people to conform to the COVID regime, I think they'll they'll inevitably do this also on political matters. And uh, I think the social credit system, the whole mandatory vaccination thing and the, the green pass that you need to go around, I think this is a, uh, a trial run for our social credit system. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I was, I was just going back through some bits of um, Live Not By Lies this week and 
it struck me that there may be there may be an analogy between what's going on now and the communist era in in terms of the way that the notion of science is being deployed. So back mm -hmm. then, you know, it's the science, it's the objective or ostensibly objective science of, of Marxist theory. Now it's the ostensibly objective science around COVID and the way that the, the breakdown between observations about science and applications of science has been has been you know so so total let me take my meaning yeah. so i mean do you do you see do you see something there that like this this kind of claim to objectivity is a, a sort of smoke screen for for yeah. you know something more nefarious oh absolutely you know one of the most important lectures academic lectures i ever heard happened in cambridge in 2009 i was there on a program and we heard from dame jillian beer who gave a, a, a lecture about the way the British culture in the 19th century took up Darwin. Mm. She said that, you know, science was the mania, Darwin was the, the, the local god. And uh, she, had, she said everybody in all the different factions in uh, Victorian society took Darwin as uh, an authoritative uh, endorsement or endorser of their point of view. For example, the imperialists said, well, Darwin Darwin justifies what we want to do because he shows that the strong rightly dominate the weak. Mm -hmm. The uh, anti-slavery people said, no, Darwin justifies our, our ideology because he says that we're all ultimately brothers deep down, et cetera, et cetera. Her, her point here was that, you know, science itself is, it, it has a pretense to be objective, but it is never, even if its findings are, 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 are obtained objectively, it has to be received by subjects, and inevitably, um, people will will pull them and use the findings of science to justify what they want to believe. Her warning was not about uh, against science per se; it was against um, the the all too human desire to claim the authority of science to uh, advance uh, political or ideological goals that may not be justified by that science. And I think that's what we're seeing here now, clearly. Mm -hmm. ironical isn't it if you take for instance someone like brett weinstein's take on science science is um firstly it you know it is a rigorous and critical looking constant re-looking at the world isn't it and constantly trying to get the right model it is not about um a search for an, a new orthodoxy yeah well, right. what, 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 what he said in that that recent interview with james denningpole is that science is not about presenting you with the conclusions of experts it's about showing you where the experts are wrong which right. which, is, which is the complete opposite of what we've been told for the last 18 months but i i think that people by our nature we have to have a sense of authority and uh science is has replaced god and has replaced the church I mean, this is a, an anodyne observation, but boy, do you really see it when the way people have responded to the COVID thing, you know, and how, do you remember how when the, this first came out, the COVID first came out, that we weren't allowed to talk about the lab leak theory that was racist, that was unscientific, blah, blah, blah. Well, about a year into it, then suddenly people are saying, well, you know, yeah, it probably did get out of the Wuhan lab. Mm. And I, I I don't know how these people within scientific institutions expect uh, the public to have faith in them because they have, uh, if they were simply, if they were going at it in a humble way and saying that, look, this is the best model we have of what's going on, but we may, we may be getting something wrong. Well, okay, that's, that's honest. And that's something I can believe in. But when you make these radical pronouncements that this is the truth, um, and then it's shown that you're wrong. Well, you and you, how can you not undermine your credibility? And we see this especially right now with the whole gender ideology and the transgender kids. Um, I mean, it is phenomenal to see what's happening in this country and in your country uh, about the way science is being abused to destroy the bodies and the minds of so many minors. I mean, it's just, it's breathtaking. Mm, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, Rod, I've got um, we're we're coming up to the to the hour now. Um, I've got I've got a I've got a kind of um, a sort of final sort of double question I want to ask you really. Um, when we're talking about the COVID stuff, I mean you've just you've just expressed um, concern about what's going on, and, and you know we absolutely you know hundred percent share that that concern. I mean in in the UK or in England, at least things are okay at the moment, but we, you know, we feel that this, this stuff may be around the corner for us as well. Um, obviously, 
obviously is having a huge impact on the church. I mean, we were just talking about the way that Durham Cathedral has started to um, say it's going to implement vaccine passes uh, for its Christmas services. Um, wow. There is a there is a sense that something is something really really significant is happening so i guess my 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 sort of first question is you know where where do you see this it's a big question i guess but where do you see this going um you know is and is this you know i'm you know i'm not asking you for like a you know kind of a, a scatological predictions but is this is this the beginning of some kind of global um technocratic tyranny the likes of which we've never seen and you know then i guess my other question is um you know one of the things in in live not by lies is is this sort of sense that there's this great there's this great hope and there's this great joy that that the saints carry with them and i was wondering if maybe you could say something about that and you know particularly i think for our listeners who many many of our listeners are very very anxious and concerned you know and and they've got good reason to be you mm -hmm. know you know what where can people find that sense of inner peace so i know that i know that's a lot but uh, yeah <laughs> take it away <clears throat> well uh, the short answer is yes, I do believe this is the beginning of, of something global and tyrannical. And even if COVID hadn't come along, I think they would have found a reason for it because the desire to control is innate to, to humanity. And we have seen here in the US, even long before uh, COVID uh, showed up, we have seen as the, we call them the woke, I think you may use, must use the same word in England. Yeah, we do, we do. Uh, yeah the, the woke have uh, increased their power and uh, hegemony within these institutions and are using them to control people and to exclude those who don't agree. And they're doing this for the cause of justice, as they say. Well, in Live Not By Lies, I talk about the comparison, the, the, the very close comparison between the woke and the Bolsheviks. You know, the, the Bolsheviks were uh, much more radical, but the same sort of philosophy drives what they do. And you can't argue with them at all. Uh, I think that uh, these people want to establish that kind of control over all institutions. It's in the US military now, it's in you know corporate America, on and on and on. Well. COVID is, uh, gives them a blueprint, the response to COVID. I mean, th this, this is not an ideological thing. COVID is real. Don't get me wrong. It's absolutely real and it's serious. But the, the, it has given a, a blueprint for how you can implement the sort of controls over a population and they will accept it. Mm -hmm. You know, And as I said, when you make the leap from the social credit system, the de facto social credit system of the, the green passport, the vaccine passport, to uh, showing how we can do the same thing to keep the quote unquote bad people out of institutions, out of public life. I think that's going to be irresistible to the power holders. Mm -hmm. But so where do we find our hope? I think that we are going to have to go through a lot of pain and suffering uh, before things get better. But this is just normal Christian history. This is what has been there in the history of the church since the very beginning. And uh, the, the lesson I learned from all these people, these Christians behind the Iron Curtain who, who withstood it, they said, you have got, uh, above all things, you have got to recognize that suffering can be good, that if we turn our suffering if we join it to Christ, if we accept this as Christ accepted his suffering, and we allow it to transform ourselves and then society, then it can be for the greater glory of God. I think that what Christians have to do now is to reacquaint ourselves in a profound way with the theology of suffering. Mm -hmm. And that means when people say, what does that mean uh, practically? Well, I mean, you, can, you can talk about it theologically, there's a lot there, but for ordinary people to look at the lives of the martyrs and the confessors through the history of the church, and even today uh, in the, with the church in China, the church in the Muslim world, et cetera, these people are, have so much to teach us. I, um, I spoke recently to a very well-known uh, evangelical leader, a lay leader in this country, who said that he came back from a trip in China, or just before he returned to the U.S. from China, some Chinese church leaders said, let us pray for your country because you all are so soft. You don't have any persecution at all. And we fear that you've gone lukewarm. Well, this church leader, he, he told me when he repeated that at a big evangelical meeting in Washington, he was soundly rebuked by the, the MC of the event who said, that's hogwash theology. Mm -hmm. No, I'm sorry. That is basic Christian theology. And it's the kind of theology that we had better, we in the West, in the comfortable West, had better uh, uh, 
reacquaint ourselves with at a very deep level if we're going to make it through what hap- what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Camilla Bendova, the, um, the matriarch of this, uh, the faithful Catholic family I write about and live not by lies, you know, she said, Rod, you should not imagine that most Christians resisted communism. Most everybody kept their heads down to avoid trouble. Only those who had the wherewithal within the spiritual strength and the moral strength to suffer um, for the sake of the truth and for the sake of Christ, they were the only ones who made it. These, this is a profound lesson for all of us today. Mm-hmm. I was thinking as you were speaking of um, C.S. Lewis's quote, and I just got it up from God in the Dock. Um, of all the tyrannies, a tyranny exercised for the good of its victims may be the most oppressive. It may be better to live under robber barons than under an, under an omnipotent moral busybodies. Um, well. Taking your line on hope, I, I suppose what we can say, and, and you seem to have indicated at the beginning of our conversation, you saw this happening in your church, that actually a theology of suffering, a spirituality of suffering is in many ways been missing in our churches for, for, for generations. And it is in some ways magnetic and attractive, you know, that it, it is, uh, it is more uh, masculine in that, in the best sense. Yeah, of, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. That, that uh, a, a lot of, guys i think don't come to church because you think well why should i go to something that doesn't demand anything of me Mm -hmm. yeah where where Mm -hmm. am i in the bigger story of this and and sometimes what churches tell them is nowhere whereas i think this story tells them actually you are somewhere if you recognize not yourself as the hero but christ as the hero who you can trail behind you know Exactly, exactly. I mean, I, I, I tell people to go watch that great Terrence Malick film from a couple of years ago called A Hidden Life, oh, based on the true, have you, have you seen that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen it. yeah. Based on the true story of Franz Jägerstater, the uh, Austrian Catholic farmer who lived in a little village high in the Alps. Um, everybody in the village was faithful. I mean, they went to church, but then when the Nazis came, most of the village became Nazis, and except for Franz and his family. And uh, they fa- he faced an immense amount of pressure to become a Nazi. You know, why not go, you know, just avoid trouble, avoid trouble. Eventually he went to his death. The Nazis executed him and he's now uh, up for sainthood in the Catholic church. I think we have to ask ourselves, what was it about the way Franz and his family lived before the coming of the Nazis that enabled them both to recognize the Nazis as anti-Christian and to uh, avoid the pressure to join them even unto death? That spirit, whatever it was that Franz Jägerstater had, is what we have to have if we're going to get through what's coming. And the thing is, the thing we have to remember too, and I'm trying to be cognizant of the time, is that this totalitarianism we're up against, it's not the sort of Orwellian totalitarianism of fear, pain, and terror, uh, at least not yet. It's much more like the uh, Huxleyan totalitarianism of trying to manipulate uh, people into conformity by reg- regulating their comforts and their access to comfort. And um, that's a more insidious form of totalitarianism, certainly for Christians. And I think that one reason so many Christians don't see the, the wickedness that's arising is because so much of it is done for the sake or in the name of protecting the vulnerable and the victims and the, out, the outliers and the outcasts, which is a very, very Christian point of view. But we can't forget what Rene Girard, the great uh, French intellectual said, uh, around the year 2000, he said that uh, the, when the Antichrist comes, he will be more Christian than Christ. He will present himself as more Christian than Christ. Gerard, who was a faithful Catholic, uh, indicated that this new, this new movement that was only arising 20 years ago when he wrote this, of, um, of protecting the vulnerable, you know, it's becoming totalitarian. That's a word he used. And he saw it as essentially big a anti-christian if you follow me yeah absolutely absolutely um rod we just want to say thank you so much for your your time with us today um it's been brilliant and uh, you'll forever be a friend of of, of the show and uh, we we hope that uh, we can stay in touch and uh, have you on at some point again well, glory to God. What I look forward to is when I can come over and we can we can lift a, a pint glass together. Well, that uh, would be, oh, well, let's hope that that can happen at some point. You well, know what, no, Rod? I, go ahead. 
I was just going to say, I've never actually met Daniel. We've just, we've just talked uh, on this podcast and on the phone, but um, never met him in person because That's... we're in the metaverse, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, well, look, uh, when I, uh, I, I'm going to get started after the first of the year in earnest writing this new book about reenchantment. I definitely plan to come over to Ireland to see Paul Kingsnorth and sit with him. Oh, but God. let me plan to come come to you and uh, let's maybe the occasion of us all meet again person will be a chance for the two of you to meet. Yeah, that would be that would be swell for sure. Um, all right, it's done. We do a meet up with your listeners. This could be a great, uh, a, a great thing. Let's well, think about uh, well, I, I, I think people are going to be um, wetting themselves with excitement at the at the sound of this, Rod. <laughs> Quite literally. Okay. Um, okay. Um, uh, Daniel, let's uh, come on, Daniel. Give us some kind of spiritual um, blessing or a prayer or something to finish, shall we? Well, the uh, I think the traditional Anglican prayer, based on Paul's word for peace, is is very apposite, isn't it? But and and in that, I'm always mindful that Christ is is both in in some ways the storm and the heart of the storm in this, uh, and that we put ourselves, we cling on to Him. So. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen. Well, Thanks, guys. And I know it's not Thanksgiving in England, but it is Thanksgiving week here. And I'm thankful for your courage and your outspokenness and for your friendship. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. And uh, thank you to all our listeners as well. And uh, we look forward to being with you again next time. <laughs>